folks, I'm Tom Vassell and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm so glad to have you guys joining us once again for our, our weekly variety show, or one of the two of them. We also have a live one on Thursday, so you can check that out when that comes out. So I'm back from my convention traveling. I went to Dice Tower West, and if you came to that, thank you. It was a fantastic time. And also back from the Gamma Trade Show, which I went to last week, where we saw a lot of different things that will be coming out over the course of this year. So a couple big things are happening. First of all, today the Jack Vass Memorial Fund auction is starting on Board Game Geek. If you don't know a lot about the Jack Vass Memorial Fund auction, this is an auction uh, that we you can post things on and uh, put games up and sell them and money goes to the Jack Vassal Fund, which helps gamers in their time of need. And so if, if you want to know more about that, you can find it out at jackvassal.org. Um, and you can go there and bid on games. You can also uh, go and put up your own games. Now, this isn't going to launch at the same time Board Game Breakfast. It's a little bit later in the course of the day, but it will be going for several weeks. So if you know companies or other people, spread the word. Tell people about this so that they can go in there and post stuff. And let's see how much money we can raise for folks this year. Uh, I said initially that the retreat tickets would go on sale today. Actually, I said September, but I meant today. Um, they're going to actually go on sale a little bit later this week, so keep an eye on that. We'll put them up on our website, Facebook, and Twitter feeds. Um, we, we had some delays in getting that together, uh, but once that's ready to go, like I said, just keep an eye on that. Also, if you wanted to uh, back the Dice Tower, the backer kit is going to be closed in a couple weeks, but we'll put a link below for the backer kit if you still wanted to get involved with that. And that's pretty much all I have for intro stuff. So let's go to what I found on the internet this week. Okay, so first of all, a couple of YouTube videos that I found. Uh, the Dragon's Tomb, which is a hilarious channel, if you've ever had a chance to see it, where they talk about, they basically explain rules to games, but they're not the correct rules, but it's really funny. He did Offensive Party Game, which is... A bit of a scathing critique on games such as this, but I enjoyed it. I also found a new, tube, a, a new YouTube channel, Alyssa's Loves, which isn't necessarily about board games, but she did a nice video called that it, basically that introduced people to tabletop games. And I'm always very happy when I can find things like this. Wingspan, of course, one of the hottest games right now, came out and was sold out everywhere. Uh, so Jamie Segmeyer wrote a thing basically apologizing that basically underestimating demand, which I don't know that you need to apologize for because how can you tell how much, without running a Kickstarter, there's really no way to gauge demand. And if you print too many, then you're sitting on tons of copies. But he explained all this. And then also Wingspan, this is pretty neat, Elizabeth Hargrave, the designer of Wingspan, uh, there was an interview with her, talking to her in the New York Times. Talk about top tier, uh, getting the word out there about board games, that's pretty cool. A couple threads I found on Reddit. One person did a 3D printing where they managed to fit 11 games into one box. So if you want to be able to travel with games in a compact style, you'll want to check out that link. And then someone proposed using a custom Spirit Island card. It's not unique to see people using games to uh, propose to people. It's kind of a cool, interesting thing, but these sort of stories always warm my heart. And speaking of warming heart, Martin Wallace and Eagle Games have apparently made up uh, Martin Wallace posted a thread on Board Game Geek promising this would be the last because it was getting kind of silly there for a while. Um, so that, that's been dealt with. The, the details of how it was dealt with, who knows? And honestly, it's none of our business. Glad that it's taken care of. And then as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, of course, and links to check out, the Jack Fast Memorial Fund auction is starting today. So you'll certainly want to check that out and get involved in that. Remember, if you ever find anything interesting on the internet and want me to feature it on our show here, just email me at tom at dicetower.com. But for now, let's keep moving. Hey 
everybody, it's Roy Canny, and this is Printed Pieces. We talk about 3D printing and what it can bring to the tabletop hobby. So today we're gonna talk all about failures in printing. It's always awesome to print out cool board game proponents, whether it be inserts or awesome different pieces you can upgrade your game with, but sometimes they don't turn out quite right. There's all sorts of reasons that you might have failures when trying to 3D print. One of those main reasons um, that can happen a lot, especially when you just first create your printer or like build your printer is to make sure that the bed is completely level. So there are normally like knobs or different things. My 3D printer has a knobs on it and you have to like adjust those so that the um, the nozzle is at the right height away from the thing the whole time. And then also you want to make sure that, that your 3D printer is level in general so that when you get to higher levels on your prints that things aren't trying to shift or act super weird. Um, and also sometimes some of the reasons for um, failure could be that you don't have proper supports. Like maybe you just forgot to click the support button in Cura or forgot to make sure that certain parts of your model were supported, not realizing that there's gonna be a little bit of overhang, so you have to have that ready. Um, and if the printer's trying to print and there's nothing for it to actually print over to hold it up, you'll end up with some failure and you don't wanna end up with just big old blobs of spaghetti where things are all messed up, even if it was a model that you thought might be able to work without supports. But yeah, and on top of that, maybe you just have a file that you're just trying to print way too much at one time and it just doesn't quite work out the way you want to. There's all sorts of different reasons that your printer could fail. Um, and if you're having tons of issues with your printer, make sure to check out there's tons of Facebook groups, especially for the different types of printers that you can ask questions and hopefully a lot of people there can help you out if you're having specific problems with your printer. And also there's tons and tons of YouTube videos out there that go into a lot of technical stuff on how to fix this problem or fix this issue. But what I want to say is no matter what, like try to get out there, try to educate yourself on those sort of things and don't give up. There's amazing things you can do with 3D printing and it's definitely worth the time trying to tweak and figure those things out. So I'll see you next time on Printed Pieces. Um, it's so awesome seeing all of you guys at Dice Tower West. So many people came up to me and talked about 3D printing and it was a blast. You're all amazing. So let me know in the comments down below what you guys are 3D printing and I'll see you on the next one. Hey everybody, for today's Chop Shop, I'm talking about a game I'm letting go from my collection, and this is Among the Stars. I love card drafting games, and when this was announced, I really was excited. When I finally played, I was very excited. It felt like Seven Wonders, with then sort of a tile-laying aspect on top of that. And it took a lot from Seven Wonders, it seemed, with a sci-fi theme. The things I've sort of uh, grown away from are, uh, and the reasons why this one is no longer in my collection, but I still have Seven Wonders in my collection, is the expansions for this were a little messier, a little harder to implement than the ones for Seven Wonders. So that system has stayed very clean. And there are other sort of, you know, uh, card drafting games now that I've really enjoyed. Like, for example, Paper Tales. I think is a better design, a cleaner design, a more fun visceral one than Among the Stars. You know, this one, you can kind of see the gears through the design, um, how this makes points off of that and that makes points off of this. And so the veneer of sci-fi, you know, space station building goes away when that's too apparent. And that's what happened here. The other games that do this kind of thing have just retained that luster for me. There's also a lot of games out there that are tile laying games lately. And so the tile laying aspect of this drafting, but then building them as tiles, doesn't feel as unique and engaging anymore to me. I can play so many other tile laying games now. So this one is out then. I will hang on to my Seven Wonders. I will hang on to my Paper Tales. Those two do a nice job of filling in that spot when I want to you know, pass some cards around, make some choices, and pass the next ones on. So that's it for the Chop Shop this time. Enjoy the rest of your breakfast. your turn. Ooh. Hi guys, I'm Randy. I'm Alan. Hey, welcome to We Game Together. We're talking about Shards of Infinity, which is a really cool purely deck builder game. Very nice. Uh, we weren't sure to even buy it based off of we already have Star Realms and we ended up buying Hero Realms later just because we, you know, preferred the theme of Hero Realms. Yeah. Plus at the time that was the only way you could get the character packs that kind of made your decks individual from the get-go. Um, but, so we were a little hesitant, yeah. ended up picking up this and the expansion, and surprisingly, I liked it 
quite Guys, a bit better. Guys, it's a cool game. I didn't think anything was going to take Hero Realms' place. Um, I really loved that game, like, a lot. Yeah. But this one, I really think it did, y'all. The, the thing that I love it that set it apart for me was that um, you can actually use your crystals in this game to buy um, the abilities on the mercenary cards if they happen to pop up in the middle row. Um, which right. I think is so cool. You don't have to actually bring it in your hand. It's like a because, one time use. Yeah. Use it right out this of the row. This is the first time I've ever seen it. it. I don't know if that's I better. I think now. that Star Realms may have it now. I don't know. We haven't been keeping up with some of the later stuff. Yeah. Um, but right in the box, it comes with that, which I thought was quite neat. Mm -hmm. Very inexpensive game. The expansion was quite inexpensive as well. You could really get into it for quite cheap. Um, lots of neat little extras, I think, yeah. as far as like a pure deck builder goes. Um, it's it's a lighter game in it general, is a lighter game, yeah. um, and it's pure deck building. Which is fine. But you know, for a you know whatever, quick, it's so quick well pick done. Me up game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it works to four people right out of the box if you want to go that route. Um, the it has like a, a power level, like anywhere from zero to thirty. And in fact, it's got an alternate win condition where if you get to thirty and you get a certain card into your hand, uh, you get to you actually win the game outright. You just do unlimited damage. Uh, but what's neat about the power dial <laughs> is that you, once you get to like 10 or 15 power, you can well, you actually, can introduce your, you have an extra power, yeah, which is from the expansion. Yeah. Otherwise, certain cards in your hand actually improve. You know, you'll get extra buying power yeah. or extra damage based off of how much it. power you have. And you can kind of tick up your power as one of your abilities. Yeah. I thought that was a lot of really neat little things that come right into it, it right a, in the box. It is a lot of neat little things. Um, the one <laughs> thing that made me cringe is I hate dials, you guys. Yeah, I the really dials. I really don't the like dials them. The dials were they're not tight enough. They're not tight enough, which I you can maybe you can make them tighter. Probably fix that yourself. They're pretty looking. They're they're really nice they look looking. Good. But gosh, every time I had to reach down and pick it up, I'm like, this game needs it would, like, like move. You know? It needs like a pair of tweezers to like pick yeah, it up. Yeah, you like you like pin it shut or something. Yeah, I, I think we were using. Hero Realms for scoring. We did it first, yeah, and then point. somebody mentioned that uh, they have like an online oh, yeah, version. That's right. Yeah. And in fact, now I'm using um, another Magic the Gathering style yeah. like uh, counter that that you can do. Um, I don't want no dials, mm -mm. <laughs> and I don't want no cards either. That like. Oh, the Hero Realms cards. I mean, they they work, but they work, but oh, it's that's horrifying. even more finicky. Like anything can knock it over. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Here I am again to showcase another great board game from the past. Here we have The Fall Guy, published in 1982 by Milton Bradley. This is based off of the hit TV show by the same name, starring Lee Majors as Colt Seavers. In this game, two to four players will try to capture a bail jumper before the other people do. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board would look like set up. Every player will put their pawn on the matching color the bell jumper will come here on the bell jumper space. Also, every player will get a set of their own stunt cards, four total. On your turn, you're going to roll two six-sided dice. Now you have two choices. You can use the die roll to move that many spaces along the board, or you can split them up, moving one die, your pawn, and the other die, an opposing player's pawn. Now the object of the game is to get the bell jumper onto your color. And you do that by coming here into these white spaces. These are the stunts. Now, in order to move there, you need to have the particular stunt face up. Once you move on there, you will turn it face down, land on grab bell jumper by exact count, move the bell jumper to your color, and the trick is that you have to have all four of your stunts face up in order to win the game. You do that by the corner spaces or by playing a special card to turn that card back over. If you do that, you automatically win the game. This is one of my favorite TV shows growing up. I had the shirt, I had the lunchbox, I had the toys, and of course, I had the board game. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet at me at RetroBoardGamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. So what's coming out from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'm taking a look at the expansion for Caverna, um, Forgotten Folk, 
this is, uh, well, just add some stuff to camera and we'll talk about that. Volt La Cosa Nostra, the new villainous expansion. Also taking a look at two big giant Euro games, Magnastorm and Brass, or at least a new version of Brass. So that's coming out this week. A lot of different reviews going on. We're also going to be doing um, a live playing of Exodus on Wednesday. So with special guests. And then, um, of course, all of our live stuff going up this week. We'll be taking a look at the top five, or, or sorry, top ten Take That games. Live Board Game Breakfast, Testing Tuesday. Just keep an eye out for all of our live stuff. It's all scheduled on our channel. So that's what's coming out from the Dice Tower Course a podcast is going up this week. Lots of different podcasts, and you can find all those at DiceTowerNetwork.com. <laughs> So what's being added to the Dice Tower Library this week? Well, I was able to get some games from uh, at a flea market type thing. So String Railway is a game I think really would work well in the Dice Tower Library. Also got Gemblo Light, which is the same as Gemblo. It's just a smaller game. So I'm glad to add this one in. Gemblo is a better version of Blocus. Warrior Knights. This is a really cool... Uh, like Twilight and Perrin, but fantasy style, big long game, but it's the kind of game people might play at a convention. And then the second edition of Doom from Fantasy Flight. Then we have uh, some GMT games we're adding, Combat Commander Europe, Labyrinth, and Empire of the Sun, the Pacific War 1941 and 1945. Not necessarily the kind of games that I would want to play at a convention, but I think some people will, so we'll add them to the library. I'm also very excited that I finally got a copy of Russian Railroads. This is a fantastic game, uh, Euro-style game. And then Belfort, one of the games that kind of put Tasty Minstrel on the map. I'm also super excited to get Pirate's Cove in the library. Uh, this is one of the Days of Wonders game. That's a lot of fun. And then Oregon. We often talk about this game. It is certainly a... Uh, what's the word for it? Themeless game, but there's a lot of cool things in it. And then Spike. This is a great railroad game that if you've not played, you definitely want to check out this one. So that's what we're adding to the Dice Tower Library this week. Welcome to The Purge. This is the row and this is the column. Throwing the dice. We have a row four, a column four. That makes it one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And this one. Here are the results of row four, column four. Yes. First game, number nine. Ah, nice uh, filler game still. I yes. still like it. It's a game you can teach in three minutes to almost anyone. Um, Is this a must have for us? Uh, I that's a hard one. Um, it's No, it's not a must have. Absolutely not. So this is leaving our collection now. I think it probably is leaving. I think so too. Oh, Race for the Galaxy, an amazing game. I tried to teach this to you a couple of times. It didn't stick then. Then you started loving his younger brother. Jump Drive! Ah, uh, I could talk for hours about Jump Drive, how much I love it, how well the cards smell, uh, the pictures on them, the points. Well, the, the pictures on those cards are the same as the pictures on these cards because this is a, a bigger version, a, a bit more mature. I'd say um, let's give it another try and then yes. see if we um, get rid of it. That's yes. nice. We have another pile, not one that says leave or stay, but that says give it one more try. I think you're going to like it, really. Next one up is a big one, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Good one. I'd say uh, right off the bat, I would say keep it because yes. we have taught this to so many people who are not into board games necessarily, but who like Harry Potter yeah. and um, uh, mostly kids who come to our house and play with our son and we play we had many many hours of fun with this one yes and it will stay for sure yes last one this week Mysterium we played this at Christmas with my brother and his girlfriend who are all who, your brother is not into board games at all I would no. say his girlfriend is uh, I like it because it's um, all about associative thinking, about what you associate with the picture that you're given, which has, in fact, nothing to do with the clues you have to solve. Uh, I like it. Our son is good at it. I like um, the concept. I would say keep it. I would say leave, but um, if you want to keep it... Uh, uh, yes. Okay. It's on you. That was this week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Hey 
folks, we're going to take a break here to talk with Robert Burke from Robert Burke Games. So welcome to our show. And we, he has a new game that's on Kickstarter now called The Silver River. So this is a 4X game. Yes. Which, what do they stand for? It stands for Explore. Yes. Expand, mm -hmm. exploit, mm -hmm. and exterminate. See, it took me years to learn that very thing. <laughs> now, what you're saying here, though, this is one that does it in two hours. Yes. That's so, not a, uh, there's been a lot of these claims that have these shorter ones, but they seem to fall short somehow. Right, and that's what I felt with my, my design partner, Nate Bivens. We love Forex games. It's probably one of our favorite things. Starting back with Masters of Orion, the very first video game came out. Yeah, that was a great uh, game. And of course, Twilight Imperium is a huge favorite of ours. But all those games, they take a long time to play. And some of the Forex games that we have played that are shorter, they're missing something. It doesn't have the full experience we didn't feel. So we wanted to make our own game. And so we focused on those things as we designed it is just how do we keep everything we love but make it fast every design decision we made was does it speed it up that was the question that we asked well one thing that I found was interesting is you have these alien races in the game but they're not like unknown to me like there's the grays I've heard of them right so all the alien races was interesting because I kind of did a lot of research on aliens that people really think exist out there in our galaxy and there's a lot of them like the grays you would know uh, the Nordics a lot of people See, I never know. heard of them yeah they're they're more and the Arcturians they're more benevolent races who are kind of supposedly watching over us and want us to evolve spiritually and and then there's the reptilians who some people think Mark Zuckerberg is a reptilian, for example. They live among us in disguise. Uh, so I kind of fell down a rabbit hole as I was doing research. <laughs> on, like, if, if you Google this stuff, you'll find these websites where these people really believe these aliens are out there. So very, very interesting, and that's kind of all the races we put in the game. So the game has a unique mechanism of this action pool of tokens where you have tons of it, this production, but it really what this production is is it's turning into like a currency that allows you to take actions of four major types. Right. So what was the genesis of this? Where did you get this idea from? Well, this was all, you know, it, it came back to our original ideas. How do we make this faster? We want to build up a civilization. We want to gain resources to be able to build ships and tech, or learn technology and do all this stuff. How do we do it quickly? So it's very easy math for every every population you have on planets is going to equal one production the next phase. Everybody's got to work. Yep. So when you get your production, it's all put into a raw production pool. And then there's a governing phase where you move the raw production to four different areas, technology, civilization, um, military, and political, based on the actions you want to complete. And you can spend all of one type of production to do as many actions as you want on your turn of that one type. And that really dramatically speeds up the game. And the math is very simple. Yeah, it's almost like having a currency to spend. I mean, there are different currencies to do things. Because usually these Forex games, there's a currency to spend on building new ships, for example. But then you don't use that currency to move on the board. But here it's kind of doing that. Right. Uh, there's these giant creatures in the game. This one's a giant head with a gun. Um, what's this guy's name again? He's Krator. Krator. He's I'm, a sentient moon uh, with a gun on his North Pole. Uh, he, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting about the game is it has these giant creatures in so that in this game you certainly can attack each other. Yes. But you can like also normal. work together to fight these giant monsters, satiating your bloodlust by yes. going after them. Yes, absolutely. So you can. Uh, there's great rewards to, to beat these monsters, but they're very hard to defeat on your own. So that drives some interaction between players to work together. You don't have to. Um, you can also work together against other players. And there's no forced combat in the game. I can move into your sector, and we don't have to fight if we don't want to. Of course, we can, uh, but it's not forced. Now, this you've, you're known for making small card games. In fact, the last game I think I saw you work on was a deck of dragons. Book of Dragons. Book of Dragons, just sorry. Came out. Mm -hmm. And that's like a lot of different things, but it's a card game. Right. And you've done many of these different card games. Right. This is slightly bigger than that. Yeah, this is. So how does that feel to like ramp up the production towards this? It feels, it feels great because uh, it's been a substantial amount of effort and it's a substantially deeper game, right? Because there's so many more pieces and it's, it's such a bigger game, and it's kind of a pet project something I've always wanted to do and being able to do it with Nate and kind of we built the game we wanted to have around. Uh, so it's really uh, it's it's been a pleasure to work on. So. 
let's talk about that working with another designer. I've done that in the past, and there's some interesting things about it. Uh, do you like doing that? Do you, because you have to, I'm assuming, are you working remotely? Are you working together? Yeah, How's it we work? work together. Well, Nate lives in the same city as me, so that makes, that makes it, it easier. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier. So uh, it's actually really great, and I have to mention our lead developer, Ken Shannon, as well. The tournament at Camelot has a bunch of games on WizKids, and he's in Florida. And it makes it easier because we can each have our own separate playtest groups, too, and then bring the notes back together as each person plays them. So that helps a lot. But what do you do if you disagree over something? Then, uh, well, you rock, paper, scissors it? My name, I, I own the company, so I <laughs> the final decision. <laughs> but does that happen like often? Is there times where you... No, you... there's, well, it's only happened a, a couple times in this, but it's, when that does happen, it's usually something small, like the name of the game, for example, something like that. It's, okay. Because uh, usually when there is a design idea, we play it through, and the play testing really tells you if that's the right way or not, right? So we don't have to just decide, uh, you know, I don't like that. You know, the play testers will tell us. When you were play testing this game, was there ever a time where you had, you're like, oh, this is great, and then you, the play testers said, oh, look at this, and yes. you had to start over from scratch? Absolutely. Like, when we first, uh, you know, we started the game with no asymmetrical abilities at all, no special abilities right. in the races, and we got that really tight, and we were really excited about so many things. We added the asymmetrical abilities, and it completely broke everything, was completely broken. So we had to revisit that and revisit that and kind of, hone them down until they were even and it's a lot of play testing right because you have to make sure that race and this race together are okay um, but when we first introduce them it set us back a, a lot to, to have to re-engineer all those abilities again yeah it's harder because they each have their own power and then they have a building that gives they a special a ability right. uh, so that's two things right and to, I mean, you could go as far as you want doing this, but that seems to be, like you said, very difficult to play test. Yes, it is. So did you blind play test to give to people and say, here's what happens? Yep, absolutely. Um, and we also had you know, issues with length on certain things that weren't working, that Ken's group really gave us a lot of feedback on that, on little, mostly little balance things, and it was amazing how we could change one little thing and it would dramatically improve the length uh, of the game. Uh, things like how much production you start with at the beginning of the game. If we did too much, it went too long. If we did too little, it went too long. It was a very strange thing, so we oh, had that's to find that right balance. Right. So 15 years ago, there were very few space games on the market. Now there's a lot. How do you differentiate it? Uh, well, I think what we've talked about is how it plays fast but you get that full 4x experience all you can do all the 4x's in this game it's got technology trees it's got all the things 4x players love politics military civilization building so you get that rich experience in about two hours so I really haven't played many games I haven't played any games that really do that for me and that's why we built this and I really think that's what it offers um, I don't I don't think then the races are, I think it's kind of unique you see these races in other games but we specifically stuck to the mythology of races people think exist in our own galaxy so that's really the that's the, really the two things that differentiate it. Other than that, you're doing all the things that you would expect in a 4X. You're exploring, um, but even the exploring is a little different, right? Because you can explore empty spaces and get little quests that will tell stories and can ripple elsewhere in the game. So there's little things like that we added as well. Okay, well, we're, I played the game. It's a lot of fun. I look forward to seeing the final product. It's on Kickstarter now. Yep. Um, so check it out. Uh, we'll have a link in the video below. And thanks for coming on the show today, and I wish you great success. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Hello, guys. It's Cardboard Rhino, and welcome to One More Rhino Says Yes. Today's recommendation is an excellent worker placement game with Dice Galore for the entire family. It's Dice Hospital. In Dice Hospital, each player controls a different hospital competing for the best reputation. Patients are represented by Dice, the higher the number, the closer they are to being back to healthy. And we have three different colors. Each hospital has some nurses, specialist doctors that are acquired during the game, and departments with different properties. 
at the start of the round the ambulances deliver the patients to the hospitals and which ambulance goes to which player is chosen by the players in turn order. The player who claimed the lowest value ambulance, as in the patients in a more fatal state, takes a bonus blood bag token from the supply and becomes the first player. The patients are placed in the wards to be treated and then players can improve their hospital by taking a new department tile from the available face-up display, following the new turn order or a new specialist to add to their medical staff. To heal a patient, you must place an available nurse or specialist into an appropriate empty department in your hospital to trigger the action shown on that department. For example, if I place this nurse here, I can heal a 5 or a 6 number patient of any color. Each time a patient die is healed, it is increased in value by one step. The medical staff meeples are placed one at a time into your hospital departments, with the effect of one department being resolved before you place another meeple. You can place each meeple only once and each department can only be activated once each round. When all hospital activations have been completed, each player must check for any remaining untreated patients in their wards. Each of them must have its value lowered by one step due to neglect. Patients that have their number being reduced below one, unfortunately, they die, and patients that are increased above six, they are healed and are discharged. Each player then counts the number of patients they discharge during that round and scores points according to this table, which basically encourages players to discharge as many patients as they can in the same round. After the eighth round, the game ends and the player with the most points from discharged patients, minus any fatalities, is declared the winner. There's a lot of tension mounting as you get more and more patients to treat and there's a lot of strategy involved. It's basically a puzzle that you need to solve around which departments to activate with which specialists so that you can take advantage of the powerful combos they can give you and you need to strategize about which patients to prioritize. Important part of the game is also the player order. Do you want to take in the dying patients and uh, be the first to choose new doctors or can you take the easier ones and what's left of the improvements. Overall, I think this game is great and it manages to take a theme as serious as the hospital and make it super fun. So right now says yes to Dice Hospital, you should check it out. Hey everyone, it's Danny and welcome to Tabletop Twitter Talk, a segment where I cover some conversations happening between our community of board game and tabletop gamers on Twitter. For this week's poll, I wanted to know, do you have any old school mass market games in your collection? The four categories I included were, no, not at all, a couple for the kids, a few because I like them, and duh, because I'm a collector. 324 people answered, and 48% said that they had them in their collections because they like them. 22% said, no, not at all. 18% keeps them around for the kids, and 12% keeps them around in their collection, well, because they're collectors. Let's see some replies from our Twitter community. For RH, he has a plethora of different mass market games, and he finds it interesting that many game mechanics from the classics find their way into new games in some form. The retro board gamer himself definitely has some, including Dark Tower, Fireball Island, Omega Virus, Mall Madness, and Dream Phone, and he could go on and on. And he loves to see how the design has evolved over years, and it's just silly fun. And Noah seems to be on the same page. He has heartthrob for the 80s dudes in fashion. For Sarah, she has an affection for Clue and Sorry and still has versions of these. They were the games she had as a kid, and she can't get rid of them as they bring a sense of nostalgia for her. For Jack, it seems like every time she's calling or trading or donating, it seems like they seem to leave the collection. And that seems like on the same line for Roy. After his big move, he got rid of some mass market games that he was holding on to play with the kids, but they got donated eventually. But Haba games have taken their place. For Jason and his family, he actually got rid of them too, but it wasn't his call. His kids actually got rid of them to give to their school because, quote unquote, they needed beginner games and we're gamers. What a proud papa. For Christy at Peace Loving Games, she still has a couple, Clue comes to mind because they still play them, and then she still keeps them around for sentimental reasons, for a game like Sorry, which was her dad's favorite, and the first board game that she ever bought for the family. And for Steve, he has Monopoly in his collection, but only because it was given to him as a gift this past Christmas. Because, you know, he's into board games. He said that his enthusiasm and gratitude during the gift giving session was Oscar worthy. I don't blame you, Steve. So how about you? Do you keep any mass market games around, whether it be for yourself, for your kids, or for nostalgic reasons? Or do you not have any in your collection to open up spots for other games? Leave a comment below or reach out to me on Twitter. Remember, I put a poll out every week, so feel free to join the conversation with our amazing board gaming and tabletop community. 
Thanks for tuning in for another Tabletop Twitter Talk. I'll see you guys next week. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about color here on Mental Health Minute. Now, color can often be subjective, but I'm also talking about color, not art. Art is a very different subject matter. Sometimes we want bright colors and really vibrant colors, and people are always saying, oh, the colors are so dark nowadays in games like brass and things like that, that really just kind of make it seem down a little. But others will say games like Brass and other types of artistic values like steampunk and things like that are earthy and detailed and very saturated and very good to look at. And a lot of people have that opinion. Now there are games like Coimbra, which is all about color. There's color everywhere. There's color, there's reds, there's blues, there's purples, there's oranges, there's grays even. And it's everywhere. And sometimes people are saying, board games need to discover color a little bit more. Be vibrant. Pop off the table. But sometimes, with too much color, or you walk into a board game room and you're like, oh, oh, that's just too much for me right now. Too much color. Can it, can it tone itself down a little bit? And that's a different experience for everybody. Oftentimes, oftentimes it depends on the mood we're in. Sometimes I'll want to play a game and be like, man, I am not in the mood to look at brass right now. And it's not often because of the art. We often will think it is, but it's really the color and how it jumps out and how it attracts to us. Um, and sometimes we'll be like, oh, games like Merlin or Coimbra is just too bright, too much to look at right now. Can we just play something a little deeper toned down a little bit? And it doesn't matter the style of the game or what type of game it is. So do you have a particular color palette that you enjoy more? What's your favorite game out of each color palette? These are just random examples of mine, but... What about you? Let me know in the comments below. What happens all the time is player counts on games. They're always, uh, don't always match your group, right? So you have a five player game you wanna play, six people show up. Or you're gonna play a two player game and three people are there, whatever it might be. This seems to happen a lot. And one of the things I found when these sorts of situations come up or you're at a convention or whatever, and two people will say, ah, we'll play together. We'll be on the same team. And I'm curious what you all think about that because this is kind of an interesting thing to me. So when you play two people as one, now sometimes this happens because one person is new at the game and I've often seen it happen a lot with uh, a couple, maybe they're working together, but it's not, it doesn't have to be a couple. It could be any, any two people working together. Um, and one of them is really interested in the game. The other one's kind of interested in the game, so they kind of work together. Or one person's new and the other person's a veteran helping them. Or again, it's a situation I just talked. There's just not enough room, so two people say, we'll be together. Now, this can be a detriment to some degree if they argue a lot, I suppose. But more than likely, it also can be very helpful. If the game uses memory or any kind of skill that's hard for a person to do, having two people makes it invariably better. Now, for me, for the most part, I don't really have a problem with this sort of thing because, hey, why not? More people are involved in the game. Even if two people are playing one, not something I'd be really keen on doing because I don't necessarily want to play half of a player's turn. But uh, I don't mind that people do this. And if they have a slight advantage for the fact that there's two of them there, what does that really matter in the long run? Now, if you're playing on a more competitive level, and I definitely have played some games that were more competitive, a heavier strategy game or something like that, and there have been some times where I'm like, well, it would kind of be nice that you, you know, you, there's two of you. Of course, you're going to, one person might miss something, and the other person's like, oh, did you see that? And you wouldn't really be keen on that in a game. Like, if Bob's about to do something, like, oh, Bob, that's a bad move. You should do this. You're like, why are you helping Bob? Why am I helping Bob? I don't know that I should. But if Bob and Carol are on the same team, then Carol might say, Bob, you missed that. And Bob be like, oh, yeah. You're like, oh, man. It's hard to beat two people. At the same time, it does allow a larger group of people to play a smaller game. Uh, I've seen his work really sometimes maybe like you have eight people and you want to play a four-player game and two people per team. But then I might say, why not just play two four-player games? And a lot of times it's also sacrificial. Right? It's not, I'm not looking at it as a negative thing where someone will say, oh, well, I know everyone wants to play this game. I'll, I'll just be on, you know, Penelope's team or I'll be on, on, on Sal's team and I'll help them and I won't really play. I'm just kind of here for the experience, which is fine. 
And I'm glad that people do that. I'm glad people come in and want to be part of everything going on. But it's just an interesting situation. Uh, maybe it doesn't happen much in your play group, but I definitely see this happen a lot. Uh, where two people say, oh, well, you know what? We'll just play together for this one. And is that a bad thing or a good thing? I think it's a, a good thing because it gets more people involved. I can see how it could be irritating if it's a very serious game and they're working together with strategy. But other than that, I don't see any real problems with it. Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. Uh, there are times where, you know, you just gotta unplug from technology and social media and stuff like that. You know, kinda recharge your batteries. And you know what? On days like this and times of the year like this, I need to do that with the gaming table. Cause, beautiful sunny day, the last thing I want to do is be around a gaming table inside as much as I love playing games. Sometimes you just got to go outside, take a breather, and smell the roses, so to speak. Take in some sunshine. So what about you? If you ever need to take a little uh, mini vacation away from the gaming table, away from reading all the rule books, Sound off in the comments down below. Let me know what you think. And go outside and enjoy life. There's a whole world out there. Our lives do not have to be wrapped up in just gaming alone. Heck, there's, there's times where the last thing I want to see is a rule book or a game. So, until then, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Hey everyone, Chris Renshaw here, and continuing with talking about women in RPGs, I wanted to talk about RPG podcasts and actual play shows where most of the hosts are, or at least the GM is a woman, so that if you're someone that may be shy or anxious about getting into this, then you can see other people besides people like me that are telling stories, creating stories, and having a good time. Now, the first one I want to talk about is a podcast called She's a Super Geek, which is hosted by Senda and a rotating cast of various female GMs and players. Now, Senda herself is not only a GM and a player, but she has also written a few RPGs herself. So it's a really great show that features a whole magnitude of different games, both that they've written, that other people have written, and just popular games in general, where they go through and play short one-shot adventures in all these different systems. The next show I wanted to talk about is a podcast called the Happy Jacks RPG Podcast. Now there's two aspects to this podcast. There's a live topic show that they do online every week, but they also have a whole ton of different actual play shows where they go through, they stream them live, but they also put them out again as podcasts where they play through campaigns of various different systems. Now the show is about half men and women, but they do a good enough job rotating people through players and GMs. So you can definitely find specific stories and games where they're either mostly women playing or women GMing or a combination thereof. Now, if you're wanting a D&D podcast that's actually hosted and run by a bunch of people that you probably have seen in other things, then go check out Relics and Rarities. It's a D&D stream that's hosted on the video platform Alpha, which you can get like a 30-day free trial of, that's run by the GM of Deborah Ann Wall, who's been in things like Daredevil and True Blood and that sort of thing. So there's another more popular example Lastly, I also wanted to mention that Corey Harrop, one of the players on our RPG show, The Dirt Bags of Holding, has also GM'd a series of shows where we did the RPG system Thong Shui, which is like an action movie kind of RPG. By far, there is many more shows and podcasts out there than just the limited few that I have done right here. In fact, I found a whole thread on Reddit you can find a huge list and there'll be something there just about for everyone. So 
In the meantime, make sure you follow us on social media and check out the Boards and Swords YouTube channel and podcast. And until next time, thanks for watching and may all your hits be crits. Hi folks, my name is Andy and welcome to Portable Gaming, the show about games which are fun to play in pubs and cafes. So today I'm going to talk to you about King Domino. King Domino is a fantastic little game, suitable for people of all ages. Uh, it's both simple but surprisingly tactical when you get going with it. And your, the aim is simple. You have a castle here and your aim is to build a 5x5 five five grid of dominoes around that. You're, when building that 5x5 five five grid, you're trying to connect all of the different terrains to have the largest grouping of the same terrain. So you want all of the oceans to touch to each other, all of the forests. And you will score points based on how big that area is times by the amount of crowns on the tiles. But what makes it interesting is how you then choose your pieces. You choose it using an interesting drafting mechanic where you might get first choice of one turn to pick your tile but that could mean you have let you come later in the turn order the next turn to try and get the piece you want so you're continuously figuring out do you want to go for the best piece now or take a medium piece and hope for a better piece next turn and it's great it's so simple it's so fun uh, like i said all ages can play we get regularly beaten by a friend of ours young son who's about five or six who's just very good at king domino and it fits in a smaller space than you'd think for a big bigger box like this for big chunky pieces like this i've definitely got two five by five grids on a map like this pictures above me there and it means it's quite nice and you can take this with you you know you're going to sit down in a cafe or a pub for an hour or two and want to play a quick game this is the kind of game you could definitely sit down and play and that's one of the reasons i think it really works and one of the concerns i do have is these tiles while gray or hard wearing aren't necessarily waterproof they are just thick cardboard and if something did spill and take those out that is a risk but we've played it without incident and it's a good game to maybe throw out there if you've got taken out the kids. I mean, this is a normal sized pub table and you could probably get a few games in there. So I'd recommend it. It's not expensive. It's a lot of fun. That is King Domino. Anyway, thanks very much, folks. I've been Andy and it's your round. Hello, I'm Matthew Jude from This Game is Broken. And this is Dead Last, where I talk about uh, board games in a very vague and generally sporadic way. Uh, I kind of hate... Kallax shelves, and I do that hatred in my favourite place, which is in principle. And not only in the principle of how dare you tell me how to shelve my own shelves, uh, you inanimate monsters, it's more of the fact that aren't they just vastly impractical? That's just really how I feel about it. This isn't my first video on shelves, because that's the kind of wild lifestyle I live. Uh, but why? Please tell me, why do Kallax shelves in a world of shelves, which is the department store where you buy your shelves, why do Kallax shelves reign supreme? And that's a genuine question. My shelves are as shelf as any other shelf, and they were £10 from a thrift store, and they do great. This first shelf here just happens to fit a ticket to subscribe size box absolutely perfectly and if I put a normal size box one of these on its side as well which is probably how I'm going to do it fits that perfectly maybe I got lucky maybe I'm just a lucky guy that's doubtful I just can't help but think that Kallax shelves in particular are just another expensive fashion accessory for board games let me know I'd love to know why you think they're better uh, than a regular shelf and that's uh, dead last Let's be controversial. That'll be fun. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much for watching, of course. We're glad to have you all with us for the ride. And thanks to my great contributors for doing all sorts of things. I didn't get a chance to say this last week because I pre-recorded the show. But last week was Dan and Cora's last time with us on the channel. Uh, for now, I'll persuade him to come back at some point. And I just want to say a big thank you to Dan for all that he's done. I think he's, they've done a great, fantastic job, and I appreciate them so much. All righty, until next time, I'm Tom Basil, though, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. We'll see you all next time. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.